Of the nearly five and a half million apps on the App Store, at least a few of those can be used to film footage on your smartphone. So which app should you be using? An app on the App Store or the native application that comes with your phone? Today, we're gonna to compare the advantages and disadvantages of both types of filmmaking applications. Filming on a smartphone gets better every single year. As processors and cameras improve, the gap between a smartphone and a high-end film camera shrinks ever so slightly. When I first had the vision for smartphone storytellers, we were using cameras on the iPhone 4 and an iPod Touch. Needless to say, quality was lacking. In the years since then, the image quality has jumped so significantly that these cameras have been used to capture Hollywood films. The biggest thing that's held the smartphone back is the lack of control over the cameras and our applications like Filmic Pro and Cinema P3. These unlock many of the features of your smartphone and allow you to have full control over the camera settings. So if these apps allow you to unlock all the features of your camera, shouldn't you film everything with those applications? Not necessarily. Let's look at the positives and negatives for the native application. First, my personal favorite, Cinema P3, in order to see when you should use each application. Cinema P3 is only available on the iPhone, but there are similar applications on Android phones that give you full control when the native application does not. The native app is surprisingly great considering it's basically the green auto mode on your typical camera. Out of the box, the phone handles all of your settings for you, giving you basic controls over exposure and focus. Things like shutter speed, white balance, aperture, and ISO are all handled by the processor in the phone. That being said, the phone does a surprisingly great job of helping you to get a great looking image in most settings. The advantage the iPhone has over standard cameras is that it's a camera with a very powerful processor built in. As a result, it's able to use machine learning to immediately take the video you shoot and enhance it based on a number of factors. When in video mode inside the application, you have a few controls. You can change the frame rate or the resolution of your video. On newer phones, you have something called action mode, which helps with stabilization when moving the phone around with some minor quality loss, but it requires a good amount of light to excel. It's kind of like a gimbal built into your phone. You can toggle ProRes video on your phone if it supports it, and you can activate the flash if you'd like to use it as a spotlight but you shouldn't. Additionally, you can switch between different focal lengths and lenses, as well as adjust the exposure of your video. The best source of control though, is tapping the screen where you can pick where you want the camera to focus, as well as what you want to be properly exposed. You can then lock in these settings so the auto mode at least knows what you'd like to best capture, but you're still in auto mode. Finally, on newer phones, you have something called cinematic mode, which essentially is portrait mode for video. What's that mean? On higher end film gear, when at the correct settings, you're able to blur out the background on your video so only your subject is the sharpest part of the image. This allows you to not only guide your viewer's attention through framing, but also by helping them to know exactly which part of the image that you want them to pay attention to. This normally requires low aperture lens as well as larger camera sensor to pull it off. The iPhone actually has a great sensor as well as a lower aperture lens, but it doesn't get as shallow depth of field as other cameras can because the sensor is still not as large. Enter cinematic mode, where it uses the processor in the camera, as well as a 3D map of the subject to determine where to blur the image and where to keep it in focus. There also might be a little bit of magic in there, but nobody's really confirmed that yet. It's just a theory. In short, it creates the image of a shallow depth of field without needing the same sensor size as what's in a higher end camera. It's not perfect, but I've been very impressed with some of the results and have used it on numerous videos on this very channel. It seems to perform well in brighter environments when there's minimal movement. When I've used it, if I talk too much with my hands and bring them into frame, it tends to have trouble determining what to blur. But if my movements are a bit more controlled, I've had it work great. Finally, you can adjust the level of focus as well as which portion of the image is in focus. It's pretty impressive and only gets better with each release, so it's well worth keeping your eyes on in this feature. Finally, you have features like slow-mo and time-lapse, making it incredibly easy to use those styles of shooting. On my iPhone 14 Pro, I can shoot 120 or 200 frames per second video in HD quality. Additionally, you can easily adjust the speed ramp after you've shot it, allowing you to slow down only the portion of the video that you want in slow motion and speed ramp it back. Timelapse automatically compiles a timelapse video after you shoot it, so it makes the art of capturing timelapse pretty painless. You only have control over which lens to use though, as well as adjusting the exposure meter, which really just means you're telling the phone if you want to push the image to a certain number of stops darker or brighter than it normally would default to. All in all, the native application is incredibly solid. So what does an application like Cinema P3 bring to the table? 
Cinema P3 is one of many apps that give you full control over your phone's camera. While this will not be a full deep dive into how to use the app, we're going to explore some of the options the application offers that can help you bring your filmmaking to the next level. There's quite a bit here, so here goes nothing. You can change your white balance, which basically tells your camera what type of lighting you're shooting in. 5600 Kelvin, or more of a blue lighting, is normal daylight lighting, while 3200 Kelvin is tungsten, or really it's just kind of the orange lights you typically see in your house at night. If you're filming in the wrong lighting and have the phone set to the wrong color temperature, the colors of your image are all going to be off. You have controls over your exposure bias similarly to the stock app, but then you can also manually dial it in through the ISO and shutter speed. ISO essentially controls how sensitive the camera sensor is to lighting. Shutter speed is a holdover from the days of film cameras when they had a physical shutter, but it essentially changes how the virtual shutter of the camera stays open while you're filming. This essentially affects the motion blur of your video as well as the brightness, which can give it a more cinematic look when optimally dialed in. For your reference, you typically want this to be double your frame rate or 180 degrees. It depends how your camera measures it. So if you're filming at 24 frames per second, you want your shutter to be 1 48th. If it's 180 degrees, the camera automatically sets it to 1 48th or whatever double your frame rate is. You've got full control over your focus, either setting it to autofocus on a subject or you can rack the focus, similarly to how a regular camera lens can rack focus. This allows you to shift where the viewer is paying attention to, possibly from something in the background of an image to an item in the foreground. You have the ability to jump between the physical lenses on your camera, but you can also digitally zoom in on your image at an interval that you choose. This simulates using a zoom lens on a camera, but I will note you do technically lose a little bit of quality from the native framing on the lens as you're just technically enlarging the pixels and not physically zooming. Beyond that, you're able to switch the look and the color science of your camera to any number of other looks and really customize how it is. But what is the real treat is it's got something called C-Log and D-Log. C-Log and D-Log emulates what's called log mode on a more professional camera, and it gives your image a bit more latitude and flexibility if you plan to color grade the image when editing in post. Often when I shoot on cameras, I'll switch to whatever their version of log is so that I can really dial the color into however I want. Finally, you have the ability to toggle more professional tools and help you to really dial in your look even further. You can change the exposure mode so that only certain tools are on auto, such as ISO priority or shutter priority. You can change your default white balance, focus modes, how the autofocus behaves, what level of stabilization you use, tone mapping, how each camera handles, individual settings, video resolution, frame rate, color science, where your videos are stored, audio source, manual audio settings, including gain, and which microphone on the phone to use or a Bluetooth microphone, and so many other minor tweaks to ultimately make the app work in the way that you want it to work. And that's just a really brief overview. The application has the potential to let you fully control your image, similarly to using a higher end camera. So now you might be thinking, if it gives you this much control, shouldn't you use it all the time? Not necessarily. Let's look at the pluses and minuses for each camera application and then explore which one that you should be using. Both applications are solid options, but it ultimately depends on what you're shooting and how you want to shoot it. I personally use both of them on a regular basis. The stock application is quick and easy to use. Since it handles the majority of the details for you, you mostly just need to pull out your phone and shoot. It even is just a swipe away and you can quickly jump there without even unlocking your phone. Additionally, since it's automatic, you don't need to take a minute to make sure your settings are correct. If you're trying to capture something quickly, you can't beat the convenience and speed. It also will frequently give you a pretty great image. Additionally, the stock app offers cinematic mode. While it seems like it's just a feature to sell new phones, as I mentioned, I've been pretty impressed with it. If you go back and look at the video I shot while I was in Brazil, which you can see right here, I filmed all of my portions entirely on the iPhone in cinematic mode. You'll see it break down a few times when I move my hands, but overall it made for a very pleasing image. And it would have been even better if I had played with the exposure meters correctly. But even so, it looks great. One other selling point for the native app, it's free. It comes with your phone, so the only price of entry is the phone that you probably already own. The downside to the stock application is that it can make the wrong calls sometimes on how to best expose your image because it's on auto mode and it's just making guesses that are educated on the image, but it's still a guess. And as a result, you could have a worse image than if you had done it yourself. Cinema P3, meanwhile, gives you full control over all the controls on the phone. As a result, you can dial in your image to exactly what you want. It helps you to bridge the gap between looking like it was a video shot on a phone to video captured on a higher end camera. 
You can also customize the experience to work exactly like you'd like, giving yourself as many or a few of the professional tools and controls. One downside is it's a bit slower to jump in. If you're just jumping into the application, you might not have everything set perfectly for the environment. As a result, you might need to take a minute to set your white balance, your shutter, your exposure, and whatever other settings you might want to tweak. There are auto modes that you can jump into quickly, but using those too heavily, someone eliminates the perks of using the application in the first place. You also need to know what you're doing when you're using Cinema P3. There's a slight learning curve as you go from fully automatic to fully manual. But that's what brings the footage to the next level, is understanding that. You're going to make some mistakes though, and those mistakes might look worse than if you were on automatic. So if you do go the route of using Cinema P3, make sure you take it out and do some test shoots where you can really make some mistakes without worrying about missing shots due to bad settings. You really should do this no matter what app you're using though, because you learn best by making mistakes and then learning what to not to do. The application also has a cost. When I last downloaded the application, the base app was free, but some of the more professional features were locked behind a $12 in-app purchase. Honestly, that's a bargain for the controls you're getting, but since the stock app is free, this is a slight barrier. There's a free seven day trial though, so it's pretty easy to dive in and see if it's worth it to you. It was a no brainer for me and I've had zero regrets for making the purchase and would happily do it again if I needed to. So long story short, which app should you be using? If you want speed, convenience, or cinematic mode, the stock app is hard to beat, especially because that's the only one that has cinematic mode. If you want full control and want to bridge the gap between phone footage and higher end cameras, Cinema P3 is well worth the cost. I have Cinema P3 as one of only 12 apps on my home screen and use both applications frequently. If I'm working to get the best looking footage I can, I jump into Cinema P3. If I'm trying to quickly capture footage, I open the stock app and capture the shot. Either way, you can't go wrong. That's all I've got for this week, but make sure you like and subscribe as I'm gonna announce something exciting next week. Let's just say it rhymes with Schmondest. Remember though, regardless of which application you use, it's ultimately not about the gear, it's about the story.